Thank you so much for joining our webinar as a part of our media activism series. It's going to be our last one of 2021, which is bittersweet, but we have a great discussion planned ahead for you. Tonight's topic is developing critical film topics. I'll go ahead and start by introducing our organization, Asian Culture and Media Alliance. We have a mission of creating a voice of unity, awareness, and empowerment for the Asian and Pacific Islander community through the power of television, film, and new media. Here are some of our highlights. I'll go ahead and move on into our event agenda for this webinar. I've already introduced ACMA, but we'll also introduce our panelists. Then we'll move into a roundtable discussion where each panelist will answer the same question. We'll also have time for some personal questions. We'll move on to a Q&A session where participants can submit their questions in the chat box. And lastly, we'll finish off by sharing how to stay connected with ACMA and how to contact us. A little bit about myself personally, I am your host for tonight and my name is Darlene Doe. I am a Take One participant this quarter. In Take One, we learn about film production and we have great hands-on opportunities to apply our knowledge. I'm also a UC Irvine student studying business administration and I'm so excited to be part of our webinar tonight. I'll go ahead and pass it on to Ran Ran, who is our moderator and who will also introduce herself. Hey everyone, really, really happy to be here today. I am also in the Take One program along with Darlene. Like she said, um, the program has allowed us an opportunity to get some hands-on um, learning in the film industry. I graduated in 2019 from business school. I didn't get to go to a film school. And so this has been a really wonderful supplemental education to something that I didn't really get to explore back when I was in college. Um, really excited to be here today and very, very grateful to our guests for being here as well. And also to all of you for being in the audience and for watching. Now I'll go ahead and jump into introductions of our panelists. First, I have Alexa Khan, who is a producer and actress and part of Three Flames Pictures. She was also born and raised in Mongolia and has produced numerous award-winning feature films and short films. Her recent film became the official selection to the Oscars from Mongolia. It's the epic feature film and multi-award-winning production, The Speed.
Ağın zayıfta mıydı bu? Emirin güç sahası çekildi. Onda kumde tarık. Next, we have Diane Paragas. She is a writer, director, editor, cinematographer, and producer of narrative features, documentaries, and commercials. Her debut narrative feature, Yellow Rose, made history by being the first Filipino-American film theatrically distributed by a major Hollywood studio. Here's a quick trailer. I never fit in. This isn't the life you wanted. Though I tried and tried. It'll be better for you. This feeling don't end. I promise. Swear I fell in love with country music when I was a little girl. When are you gonna let me hear you play? But if you're too scared to perform them songs, I'll run away. Ain't gonna do no good. With nowhere to go. I received another letter. Last but not least, I have Georgina Tolentino. She is a writer and actress and part of No Dogs, a film of, made in 2021. She's also of Italian and Portuguese and Filipino descent. She has worked for numerous production films in Los Angeles before starting Urduja Films, which focuses on amplifying women's perspectives and intersectional storytelling. Let's take a look at Georgina's short film trailer, No Dogs. Pass it on to moderator Ran Ran, who will introduce our questions. With that, I think that has allowed us to properly introduce 
all three of our very wonderful guests today. I just want to thank you guys again for being here. I'm very, very honored to be in this room with you guys. I think if I was 13 again and I saw a room of like such awesome and incredible Asian American filmmakers, I would have maybe, you know, tried to make films when I was younger, you know, maybe I wouldn't have gone to film school. So I'm like really honored to be here or maybe I wouldn't have gone to business school. Um, but why don't we just go ahead and launch into the questions? Um, we're going to start with some general questions for all three of you and then go more deeply into some personal questions about your projects. But the first question, um, one that you're probably asked really often, but a very important one is that we would love to hear about how you started in your journey in filmmaking, how you got involved and what made you start your journey in the first place. Yes, yes. Okay, so first of all, I just wanted to thank you everyone for inviting me to be a guest and uh, join this uh, wonderful uh, group of filmmakers. And uh, it's an honor to be here. And um, the, all the trailers look amazing. Uh, I'm very excited to watch uh, both films. <laughs> so um, my film journey, uh, my background is actually finance. I uh, came to the United States actually when I was 16 as an exchange student and um, I decided to pursue finance um, as a, a major and so I went into finance I got my bachelor's degree in finance and um, I was actually in wealth management sector for seven years and as I was there um, you know every time um, you know I would be sitting in an office uh, at a desk and talking to people I've always had this inkling and this intuition, this this feeling that I just couldn't go, you know, let it go um, of being in entertainment. So I started taking class and I grew up uh, being on stage and performing and all of that. So it's just something that I thought it was just some something that I've done when I was a little girl. But when I, you know, it will be lost. And um, I didn't think about it as much when I was pursuing uh, in Korean finance. But as I was there, it was just more and more I was attracted to it. So I started taking classes uh, in acting and I started taking, uh, just started connecting with people. And then one day um, after speaking with my husband, we've decided to take a leap of faith and uh, I have switched my career to uh, from finance to entertainment, acting and uh, filmmaking. And as I was in acting, I decided um, to get into production side because it was very, very interesting, the business side of it. And so that's basically how it started. I uh, met my business partner, Trevor Doyle, who's the uh, founding partner of Three Flames Pictures. Uh, and A.B. Gumbold is also a founding co-founder of Three Flames Pictures, our production company. He lives in um, Mongolia. He's a fairly famous actor and director. And so the three of us came together and said, you know what, let's create a company that will bring, um, you know, Asian and unheard voices to the U.S. and let's make this connection. And so that's how our company started and that's how we've started making films together. So that is my uh, little bit of a, a background on how I started. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alexa. I too am from a business background. <laughs> so it's very, very wonderful to hear you talk about how you changed careers. Um, Diane? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> I, uh, I think I always love the idea of films, but like you said, Ren Ren, when I was in college, which was long before you were, there just weren't any female directors to even look uh, to or even realize that that was a possibility. I mean, it sounds sort of backward, but it's true when you're kind of in college and you're deciding on what you're going to major on, you're, you want to do something that you can achieve. And it just wasn't, it didn't occur to me. I did study film studies, but I didn't study film production as a minor, but I was in the liberal arts school and I studied actually China studies of all things. I'm Filipino, but I studied China studies. And, um, and then when I, I moved to New York, where I live today, I, I got into advertising. And then in my first job in advertising, I kind of knew already that I wanted to be directing or to be in some kind of production. I think I'd realized, you know what, this, this is something I'd like to do. And this ad agency was very small and they were primarily focused on print. And so there was this opportunity to 
expand their commercial, um, you know, video aspect. And so I volunteered to be an agency producer and how I went to film school is I hired this company, which still exists. I found out called you direct, and they actually, um, allowed the agency producers to direct. And I said, listen, I'm going to hire you guys on all these projects. I'm super young, but you have to train me on the job. And so, um, that's kind of how I learned production. So they, they, they showed me how to edit. They showed me, um, you know, the ins and outs of shooting. And, um, I even got a director credit on these things that I was just learning on. So it was a bit of a hustle. And then after that, um, I went on to work at MTV and then I moved to Asia and I, um, I produced and started directing on a documentary series. And around that time is when I wrote, uh, Yellow Rose, which was a while back. So, um, I was sort of naive in, in the first time I tried to bring this film out because I didn't really have a lot of experience in, in much of directing. And I tried to get it financed. And at the time and for a long time, anybody in Hollywood were, were looking for films of people that looked like me as the protagonist and certainly not a film that was about an Asian girl living in Texas who wanted to be a country singer. So uh, it took a while. I kind of put it on the back burner and I ended up working a lot in the documentary film space. So I, I made my first uh, feature for PBS, the feature documentary, which was about Filipinos in America. And then I went on to make Brooklyn Boheme and then sort of came back around to Yellow Rose many, many years later after I had sort of established myself in other types of directing. It's an incredible story, and we definitely have more questions for you later about your transition from documentary to um, narrative. That's definitely something I think we're all very curious about. But let's also hear from Georgina, which I think we're having some issues seeing you visually, but maybe we might be able to hear you um, if you are here and can hear us back. Oh, there you go. Can I see a little bit? Okay. Um, so you'd like, you'd like me to ask some of the question in regards to starting the journey into filmmaking. Is that right? Uh, I believe I, I just started ever since I was a little kid. I've always loved storytelling. My dad was very passionate. He was a film buff. And I think we watched Kurosawa films, really classic films. And, and I fell in love with kind of how it made me feel. And um, I ended up going to university for architecture, which uh, spoiler alert, I'm not doing. <laughs> And uh, I just, I, I kept acting. I kept taking acting classes and I really felt challenged and fulfilled to be seen and um, kind of explore different parts of me that I normally, um, I think, wouldn't. And I, I love the challenge of kind of putting myself in um, other people's shoes, but it ended up actually being that you actually just explore a different part of yourself. And, um, you know, as I moved to LA, right after college and uh, not seeing necessarily opportunities and kind of feeling discouraged by uh, the lack of representation and kind of um, roles that I felt were kind of degrading. Um, I didn't even want to bother to audition, but doing plays, I think for me was very fulfilling. And so I felt, you know, what, why don't I empower myself to um, collaborate with other artists and create art, artistic projects and short films and films and develop films with other people that, are meaningful and uh, make me feel as though I'm also part of helping people be seen and heard who are, who are not represented. And so for me, I am kind of, you know, kind of a multi hyphenate, um, just as everyone else is here, but in the more performing arena. And so for me, you know, it really is about just kind of um, painting the canvas in a different way, using a different platform to kind of tell tell stories. So for me, I just, um, I, I'm acting still and I'm also still creating stories and also producing. So that's kind of what it's turned into. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, and, you know, speaking of, um, you know, representation, everyone here at this round table has come to the table, having worked on something that was very culturally specific and like true to your experiences, perhaps what kind of obstacles did you guys face trying to get your projects made and these culturally specific projects? And do you feel like you encountered resistance in ways that you might not have, if your projects were intended for a quote unquote broader audience? And we can start with Alexa again. 
Yes, uh, so that's a really good question. So uh, definitely. So my, you know, I'm from Mongolia. So it is something that, uh, you know, Mongolia is a very uh, population was very small. We only have three million people, and the land was a big place. Um, a lot of people know us uh, by Genghis Khan, and the stories that are told around the world are usually, you know. The, this warriors with swords and killing people and just taking over the world. So this, uh, the steed was something that was more of, of a cultural. It was, um, it came from a very famous, um, poem. So we kind of, uh, made, we created the screenplay from that. And then, um, we made the film. So it's about a horse and a boy and it's about a culture there and it's their love of, um, each other and love with the land and, and mother nature and everything. So it's a very unique story where people will hear it and say, wow, that sounds very compelling, but it was a challenge to raise funds for it because it's spoken in Mongolian with subtitles. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not something that a broader audience will love, um, especially because we don't have many Mongolians around the world. So that was definitely a challenge. Um, but in, in also in a way people were intrigued and interested because, uh, you know, many of them are like, oh, you know, it is Mongolian. It's very unique. So it actually had both, uh, it was uh, both unique. So it kind of gave us the advantage, but it was also uh, very challenging because at the end, everybody would just say, how do we make money? How do you make money? How do you get our returns? Because, uh, you know, who's going to watch it? So that was one of the biggest challenge um, of being, you know, being unique and uh, minority and not with a broader audience. Um, so, yes, it, it was definitely challenging. Yeah, so I had talked about, you know, this film taking a very long time to make. So Yellow Rose is about a young Filipino girl who wants to be a country singer. And uh, in the beginning of the film, her mom uh, gets arrested by ICE and is taken away to a detention center, which causes our 17-year-old heroine to have to find a new home. And uh, at the same time, serendipitously, or really through survival, she comes to um, to find her voice as an artist as well. So it's about um, it's a coming of age story. It's a it's the journey of an artist, and it's an immigration story all at the same time. Um, so when I went out, I was reading about all these producers in Hollywood, and I managed to get a hold of a couple. Um, and one in particular, who was this uh, Asian American producer who I greatly admired. And lo and behold, out of nowhere, he did read my script and he took it on um, and right away. And he so I was very pleasantly surprised. But in his case, he was getting finance from China and had asked me if I would change the lead character to a Chinese character, which was not at all in a racist. But he knew that that would appeal to his investors. And, you know, I kind of had a good long think about that and. Um, to me, the answer was no, because part of the reason that I wanted to make the film in the first place was that as a Filipino American specifically, I just did not see images of myself on the big screen. And um, around the same time, you know, I was seeing colleagues of mine of that same age kind of going out with their first films and and sometimes they would pick projects that weren't exactly the best script, but it was a great opportunity or it had financing. And I would see those people compromise themselves and make a film that they weren't particularly proud of and then never work again. And that's a common story you'll see in Hollywood. So I made the very hard decision to say no and went to try to throughout the years, tried to sort of intermittently get other people to believe in it. And I just kept getting the same answer, which is kind of like what Alexa said, that there's just no audience for something uh, about Filipino Americans, even though Filipino Americans were the set are the second largest Asian minority in America, they still didn't think there was an audience for it. And I have to say, uh, because this is about representation, I never understood that. I am not a cowboy, yet I watch Westerns. I'm not a superhero, yet I watch superhero movies. 
Why do you think that the only people who would want to see this story are other Mongolians or Filipinos? Stories are stories are stories. And the, mo and the more specific and the more personal and the more detailed those journeys are, the more universal they are. And I've had the great opportunity. Unfortunately, Sony released our film under a pandemic, but we were in 1,200 theaters in America, uh, picked up by all of the major theaters, AMC, Regal, all picked it up. And I just think back to all those years, more than 15 years of me trying to convince people, and we've won dozens of awards. We were on a lot of the best films of 2020 lists. I just want to go back to each and every one of them and say, I told you so it doesn't, it doesn't matter that your audience is the same people as your protagonist. That is the most absurd thing I've ever heard. And it's based on presumptions that we now know are not true. Um, if anything, I think audiences today want to see a true representation of America and very soon America is going to look more like us and less like what people think America is. So um, I think all of those obstacles and all of those times and all of those no's, um, I feel justified in the fact that that people want to see stories, first, of people that look like themselves, and secondly, of people that don't look like themselves, because it, it expands our horizons and expands our worldview. That's part of the reason all of us here love film. It's the thing that we look up to the most. It's the thing that has um, importance in our lives. And I, I cannot underscore the importance of representation um, you know, I have a six-year-old. I heard your kids in there or somebody in the background, Alexa, you know, part of now as a mother, my mission is to, to, to show images to my daughter of, of people that look like her. So um, anyway, the, the answer, the long, the, the, the long answer to your short question is that it was very difficult um, and it is a misperception. It's our it's our job to educate people in, in positions of finance and positions of power at studios, at, at the agency level, that these movies that we're making are not just for us. It's for the world. And it's a misconception that these monies do not make these movies do not make money. And it's a misconception that people do not want to see images of people that don't look like themselves. Beautifully said, Diane. Thank you so much. Georgina, did you have, did, were you able to hear the question? Would you like me to repeat it? Um, or you can just go ahead and launch in if you have thoughts. That was so beautiful, Diane. I, I really resonate and I think I have a similar answer. Um, I'm, I'm kind of still in that stage of getting things made and for the same reason. You know, I've been working on other film for quite a long time and now it's moving because of what's been happening with representation and, and, People, you know, years ago would say, oh, people don't, female-led movies aren't doing well. And what, you're going to do a mixed race one and a Filipino one? Are you crazy? Like, that's just, there's so much against you. But I think one of the best attitudes um, I think I adopted was to be an example, to prove to even myself that it's possible. And so I just kept believing in it and it's still going. Um, and, and similar to the short that I'm doing that I'm expanding to a larger version, um, you know, we financed it ourselves. It was, it's 15 minutes, it's short, but it, it, what I've been seeing is people reacting positively who are not Filipino, who actually came up to us and said, you know, my family who is from Romania had signs that said no dogs or no Jewish people or no Filipinos allowed. And they, they, they felt seen and they're not Filipino. I think it, it, akin to what you're saying, Diane, is that it's really, that's what art is. When you create something that's universally relatable, that's really the whole purpose of something that can unify all of us through media and art and um, bridge that divide. And so we can get a greater understanding that, you know what, they're not, we're not so different. And so, yes, I have the same obstacles that people like to throw those things of, of those specific things that make us unique a hindrance. But I like to turn around and say, you know, what, we're actually one of the top consumers of your movie tickets, of your content, of, of engagement online. We're very, we're very active. So why not us? And we actually don't just represent 
Filipinos, we are part of the American history. And that's what I want to normalize is putting us in period pieces, putting us in situations that to, so, so that kids can see that um, and subconsciously go, wow, I'm a part of this large platform of media and I'm seen and I want to do more of that. So for me, you know, I think the obstacle, I think, has just fueled me to go, you know what, I'm going to prove y'all wrong. <laughs> so I'm still on that path. And Georgina, that gives me a perfect segue into our next question. For those of you in the audience who might not know, fun fact, the AAPI um, cultural community is actually the second um, most visit, biggest visitors of the movies, um, right behind the Latinx community. So we have, as a community have a lot of power. And so the next question is, how can community members mobilize and support projects made by underrepresented creators? And this could be community members at every level. Um, and I'd love to start with Alexa. Um, so that's a, um, I think, yes, having a community come together and supporting each other is so important. So um, I am in the, I'm one of the board of directors in Chinese Chamber of Commerce in Los Angeles. And I was also, um, I attended recently Asia Society and they have this new initiative, um, Asian Women Empowered. And um, it was more on the entertainment set. And then they, um, honored Lisa Ling, a journalist from CNN, and uh, Chun Yen Chen, she is the Asian Pacific uh, Community Fund's executive um, director. And uh, so it, they were honoring all of those ladies who made differences in our community and uh, became our voices. And so it was just very empowering for me to sit and watch all of these um, women in all of our communities coming together. And, you know, unfortunately, it kind of, you know, especially our community, AAPI, um, with the with the unfortunate event of the anti-Asian hate and what's been happening recently really just catapult this movement uh, to come together and really bring the voices because, you know, most of the time we are the, 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 you know, the ones that just follow or the ones that, that kind of just sit down and take it, the ones, the model minority, right? So unfortunately, that type of event kind of just pushed us forward. And, you know, some of us are very loud and want to do it, but some of us just uh, kind of sit back. And what I've kind of noticed uh, recently is that all of us are really coming together and things are changing and things are changing in the media and being represented. And it, it just all, all starts with the community. And one of the things that um, the executive director of Asian Pacific Community, community Fund was saying is that she was saying, you know, go out there and be a part of your community, Be meaning like be a part of your city, whatever they're doing. If they have a chamber there, be a, a part of that and actually try to be on the board because when they see that uh, an Asian person on a higher seat, um, it shows that we can lead. It shows that we can do things because, you know, there's studies have showed that a lot of us are uh, – very involved in donating, very involved in philanthropy, but uh, not a lot of Asians are still not up in the, you know, in the power position. So it's something that we have to also go out there and be active in model. And in that sense, also, you know, pushing entertainment and pushing these uh, films um, and arts forward, because that is something that one of the best way to reach people is uh, supporting art. And so um, I've seen that many uh, communities are doing that around um, us. And we also have to do better in pushing that forward and coming together and really uh, supporting each other. So I think, you know, as a community, uh, pushing forward is really going to help us. And we just have to also do our part in being involved. So that's what I would <laughs> like to say. I wanted to shout out two organizations who were particularly um, supportive of my own film um, when it came out. Uh, one is called CAPE, which is the Coalition of Asian Pacific and Entertainment. 
and Gold House, who gave us a gold open. And those of you who don't know who Gold House is, they um, they are an organization that are out there to promote Asian led and Asian directed um, and Asian American films. Um, and they're probably most well known for mobilizing a lot of people to buy out theaters uh, when a, a, a movie of Asian that's Asian led uh, comes out. And they kind of were formed right around the time Crazy Rich Asians came out and since then have supported basically every major, major Asian American film that's come out. You'll see them be present. Um, so those are two organizations that you can kind of look up and you can uh, kind of make your own gold opens. But by the way, you don't have to go through that organization. Um, what they encourage people to do is get all your friends together and buy out tickets because what they, um, what I like is that all of us here are so business minded. What gold open and gold house figured out is that when you have an independent film launch, the opening weekend numbers determine how many more theaters your film continues to play in. So if you can make efforts to have that be a very successful open, that's why they called it gold open, you have a better chance to see your film uh, succeed. Um, and they were in no small part uh, helpful for the the last two movies that won the Academy Award were led by Asian directors, and both of those films received gold opens, and both of them did quite well on their opening weekend. And they were they tried with us, but we were literally in the dead of the pandemic. This when we released our film, but we did receive a gold open. And then the third thing is something that I've tried to do on a, a personal level, um, and so we have a phrase. Georgina, you'll know this one in the Philippine community called crab mentality. And, and that is this idea that when someone succeeds like crabs, you kind of take them down instead of raising them up. When one of your own community succeeds, do you just take them down? And that's been common in our community. I think in a lot of communities, because there's this uh, perception that if you have, there's only one person that can make it. And by the way, that's the thing that we're battling now in Hollywood. So there are open doors, but literally it can be one Asian film a year that kind of makes it. And, and that's, so, that's so unfortunate. And so there's this sort of crowd mentality there. So what I tried to do is, um, together with PJ Raval and Ramona Diaz and Isabel Sandoval, we formed this group called Philippine X Filmmakers, Georgina, which we welcome you to our community. But we worked together, Isabel and I, Isabel, who a great filmmaker, her film Lingua Franca, uh, competed in the Venice Film Festival, but not a lot of people know that Isabel and I directed a film right before we shot our own films. We collaborated, I directed, and she edited for our producer, uh, Cecilia Mejia. We both shared a producer. So we actually collaborated together literally weeks before we both shot our own films. And we kind of looked at each other's screenings and gave notes to each other when we were in the editing process. Um, so you know, I'm always sort of, you know, getting advice and giving advice to all of my Filipino colleagues. And, and then the third thing you can do is if you're lucky enough, and I'm very fortunate to be now attached to a few uh, sort of studio films and, you know, at every one of these uh, projects, I always suggest a Filipino lead, even if it's, and all of them are not Filipino or even Asians films that I've been attached to. I suggest a Filipino protagonist. And for three of my projects, they said yes. So these were written for whoever, colorblind casting. And I'm just like, why not a Filipino or a mixed race Filipino? And they said yes. So there's this very, you know, we're amongst friends. There is, the, and I, I joke to my, my colleagues, I'm kind of like, there's this moment right now because of the horrible incidents of Asian hate that there is a sort of white guilt uh, phase of green lighting things. And guess what? We should take advantage of it because it's a small window and it is a kind of reparations uh, for the 15, 20 years it took someone like me because of this to get a film made. I'll take it um, and you should take it. And I think you know, Hollywood is trying to make amends for our lack of representation. But when you get your foot in the door, go in full and try to bring everyone that you can with you along the way. Um, 
So I think those are things as filmmakers we can do, not just in front of the camera, but also try to hire below the line Asian cinematographers, female cinematographers, female editors, Asian editors, you know, uh, we as directors have the ability to affect what's in front and uh, and who's working on a film. So if you get to a point where you have a platform, use it to um, to raise other people up and also collaborate and and celebrate your colleagues. Don't compete with them. <sighs> Sorry, my dog is. <laughs> well, you know, I agree with, with everything you're saying. I think uh, I, I fully support Gold House and, and the gold openings. And that's kind of what we have to be, even in um, non film related things. You know, if you want a business to, you want more representation of a certain makeup line, or I don't know, just more representation of a certain person, you have to be a consumer of that. And I think we got to put our, our kind of money and our activism where our mouth is. If you want more representation, go to the movie theaters opening weekend. And I do that. With, with not just Asian films, but all films that don't have, that have a person of color that I feel like I really believe in or a friend has worked on, even as an editor or if they're the director or the writer. I think what's um, really important is, yes, uh, celebrating and collaborating with your Asian filmmakers and colleagues, uh, but also learning to be intersectional. I think when you mentioned um, model minority, I watched that segment on John Oliver and uh, the man that I wrote our short with, Alex Fabros, was featured on it. And they talk about what that means. And model minority wasn't given to us by each other. It was given by society, uh, by white patriarchy to um, separate us from coming together. And I think what's really important is um, seeing movies like even in a larger scale, Shang-Chi or even Blue Bayou to see people in the audience who weren't Korean or Asian to come and support. And for me to bring my friends of different backgrounds to, to celebrate different cultures is also very important. So I think if you want to support underrepresented people, uh, I think you have to bring your friends like Diane suggested and, and Alexa suggested and, and of all different backgrounds and, and have these conversations after and kind of find that common ground to unite. It's very important. Um, and I agree with the crab mentality, you know, and I think women have it too. Uh, I think for a long time, we, we think, oh, there could only be one of one woman who's going to make it or one uh, person. Even for me, when I was auditioning, um, there would be a sense of cattiness for that one Filipino girl or that one Asian girl that always got the roles. When I think we have to reframe how we look at things and um, it's movement for one is movement for all. And we have to kind of view it as in a way of, of, of encouraging each other and supporting each other to start these groups, to uh, stop by a friend's screening or support, even how small, if it's a small film or a big film, just supporting your colleagues and encouraging because I don't know, I missed the earlier part, but I don't know if either of you have, um, having um, family members that are encouraging of being a filmmaker. Cause I know maybe someone's listening out there and you know, um, our family, our chosen family is our filmmaking family. And it's very important to, to say, you know what, keep going, don't give up. Because maybe, maybe our colleagues aren't getting that from their family members. They want them to be a nurse or whatever <laughs> and, you know, have that rap mentality. But, but this is a part of that process of why we're not necessarily represented because we are not necessarily naturally pushed in that direction because of our uh, immigrant heritage and, um, you know, the, the, the kind of support that's there for that. So I think the more that we can be that parent for each other, be that support for each other, we can change the trajectory of the generation of our, our children and my, my niece and and people who can look at media and see themselves in it. Um, it was very emotional to see, I mean, Shang-Chi and Raya were, are very large movies, but for little kids to see themselves in action figures and to dress up and to, to be really proud about who they are and not be made fun of. And I think that's really a subconscious thing that um, I think is important with the kind of content we end up supporting in the large scale is what gets subconsciously passed down to um, young kids who will grow up and know that they're allowed to take up space in this world. So the more that you support Asian representation in media, the more those people will get jobs in maybe other things and other things and other things that your kids will end up watching. That will be something that is uh, representative of, of who, we, who we are. Thank you all for such beautiful responses. I don't know about all of you, but sometimes I 
get to walk away from a conversation with a friend or a confidant and I feel very refreshed and very empowered. And I certainly feel that way in this conversation right now. Um, we're coming up on our last general roundtable question. Given our time constraints, it looks like it might be our last one. I'm very sorry we didn't get a chance to ask you guys or ask you ladies specific questions about um, your projects, but I think that this last question is really important. And it is, what advice do you have for young and aspiring Asian American storytellers who are at the place now where you might've found yourself um, not too long ago, maybe a long time ago, um, but trying to take up space in the community and help uplift their own and their friends' voices? And once again, we'll start with Alexa. Thank you. So, yeah, what I would say is just keep going. Uh, if you have a story and if you are if you are acting, whatever it is that you are doing in the entertainment industry or anything that you're doing, just in general, uh, you know, whatever you believe in, you just keep going. And um, yes, we are uh, underrepresented. Yes, there are challenges, but you know, those challenges are something that also pushes us to be better, to do better. So um, to me, it, it's just, you know, keep pushing forward and really get together with people who support you, uh, who are with you. And so, um, and also seek out help, right? Seek out mentorship, seek out somebody who has done better, who is doing good. And so ask for their help. And, um, and whoever, uh, one of the things that actually, it, it was very difficult for me to switch from a very uh, stable job to a okay. filmmaking. And so one of the things that kind of reassured me that I'm in the right place was that I started taking acting class and I had, you know, a group of uh, students who were just, you know, sharing the same thing. Um, uh, you know, struggles of uh, getting roles and uh, struggles with all sorts of things, finances and everything. And just having that community and, um, you know, sharing the struggles and stories and coming together and deciding to do something was some one of the things that I was like, okay, I'm in the right place because everybody is, you know, deep down inside, they really want to help you. Um, even though that there is some cattiness, like, oh, she's that. And so, you know, I hope that, <laughs> you know, there, there's the jealousy. But um, even though that is that, w when you portray that I want to be behind you, I also want to support you, that's what you also get. Um, you know, what you get is what you, uh, what you give is what you get. And so coming together and uh, starting the journey of filmmaking it really started from acting and just uh, a few students, um, we didn't know anything about filmmaking. We'd started to work on it. And then we met uh, some producers and then I've decided to form a company. So it just one thing led to another. I firmly believe that, you know, I can be in this space and my voice can be heard. And, um, you know, you just gotta start somewhere and it's baby steps. Sometimes it's hard, um, but sometimes it takes you somewhere. So. I would just say, keep going. Yeah, I want to echo that. I think something I always, I think, you know, with my own journey, there there was a big gap in, in terms of years where I just decided I, I wasn't going to be doing narrative film. I was doing documentaries, which I love as well, but it just seemed as if I didn't, it wasn't going to happen. And so I just remember uh watching um this director mira nair speak about making a film where she returned to making a south asian film after she had done a string of kind of hollywood movies with bright, white protagonists and someone in the audience asked her why did you do this film after so many big hollywood movies and she said because in that time nobody else was making movies uh about my people. And if they were, they were white people making stories about my people and that that's not acceptable. So she said she felt it was an obligation to return. And if, if she wasn't going to do it, maybe nobody would do it. And so that's actually when I went back and picked Yellow Rose back up again, something in her words. And I think maybe the time that I was in that my career 
made me feel like it was an obligation and not just some selfish thing, but nobody was doing it. And so why not me? Um, and at that point, I think I, I started looking at the rejections and the no's in a different way than when I first was getting them. And I saw that as almost a kind of fuel. Um, and then what really, the other turn, if I can use my own example and my own journey is when I started going to my own community, instead of going and asking permission from Hollywood or from, you know, the patriarchy, I just went to other Filipinos and they, I didn't have to convince them. They had the same goals. And if you have a film that has a message or that has represents a certain community, go to that community because they will be aligned uh, with you. And then the third thing I'm going to steal from Ira Glass, and that is your first stuff is going to suck. And I really wish someone told me that because all our first stuff sucked and you just got to keep making because people that gravitate towards film have one thing in common. We all have good taste. We, for the most part, know what a good film is. If you listen to film students, we all have the favorite same films. So you recognize what somebody who has mastered their craft looks like. And then you look at your own film and you're like, this is shit and this is not. And it's, guess what? Their first shit was shit too. And you just have to keep practicing. That to me is possibly more discouraging in a way than the no. So we as sort of brown people, filmmakers, we have it from both sides, but there's one way of just you know, as we've all said before, just do better and stay in the fight and persevere. But on the other side, that self-doubt that you wanting to be an artist, you wanting to, um, to find your voice, that's hard. And it's hard because you, you're, you, you recognize your own faults. You recognize the, the gap between the thing you made and the work you admire. And it's a process of going through that. And what, what happened for me is uh, by the time I did make Yellow Rose, I had had a ton of experience. I was a way better filmmaker than if I would have been given a big check at the beginning of my journey. So, um, and I'm still learning and I'm still hopefully going to make a better film the next time and, and so on and so forth. So don't fret. It's supposed to suck. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That was actually really refreshing to hear. <laughs> um, I think some of the advice that I would say is to be the example you want to see. I think sometimes we find it almost impossible to achieve our personal goals and our career goals, but I think if you just stay consistent and really focus on the kind of social impact you want to have and the visibility you want to have and the, the heart behind it. I think I, I took some time off as well because I felt so icky with, with LA, just the kind of optics and the, the game. I didn't want to play it. I said, you know, I always wanted to do this because I felt the most fulfilled performing and I felt the most fulfilled writing and, and watching film. Like there's just a different feeling that I get a feeling connected to everyone else watching movies. And I think it made me feel less alone. It made me feel seen in my problems and in my issues and, and inspired me to overcome my obstacles. And falling in love with your why again and again and again and again, and it changes, I think is the best um, kind of way to kind of persevere as you kind of morph. You know, I wasn't the same person I was 10 years ago or five or even a month ago. We just kind of keep changing. And I think you kind of, you really have to, it sounds so cheesy, but you have to believe in yourself and you have to, what is that saying? You have to believe it to see it. Like, I think that if you, if I, I've had a lot of doubt because I don't see anyone necessarily like us until recently creating movies. So it's almost seems like we're the people that pave, is paving the way for things that have never been done and it can feel very heavy. But I think just knowing of the bigger thing and the bigger impact that you have, I think one of the most meaningful moments was having Alex Fabros, who is near 80 and member of FONS, share his deep experience um, with the Filipino American National History Society of his work in um, the Watsonville riots. And he said, 
may I see your short in, in, in this date on May? And I said, sure. He says, I actually want to see it before this date because after this date, I will go legally blind in one eye. And I want to see it before I go blind. And he was able to see it. And after he said, Georgina, I've been waiting 30 years to see my work. I've just been waiting 30 years to feel seen. And honestly, at that moment, I don't care what happens after. That's what mattered. That's what making films is about. Honoring our community, honoring the unseen. And if I can keep doing that and making one person feel seen, that's it. <laughs> that's it. And I think that's what you have to kind of work from. And that's having him seen pushes me to get the larger things made. And um, I don't really care. The naysayers kind of get filtered out. So I think just focusing on your why over and over again and, and different ways you can do that to just push through the doubt, the self-doubt, because your self-doubt will be overshadowed by that kind of um, mission that you have. Thank you so much for that final and beautiful note. Um, we actually have one more surprise question from the audience, um, but to respect the time that you are all giving us today, we can do this like very rapid fire, quick question time, 30 seconds. But the question from the audience is, do you see a near future where we might see production houses, studios, or more collaboratives dedicated to developing and producing content exclusive for API filmmakers? Definitely. And they are working on it right now. And uh, I know people who are working on it actively uh, with funds behind it. And there are grants actually for API, especially for women. So yes, that's a yes. <laughs> Yes, um, and I think yesterday or the day before, speaking of Gold House, they just launched a film fund initiative for um, AAPI filmmakers uh, to make a seven minute short. Look it up, I can't remember what the name of it is, Gold Forward or something, that's probably wrong. Um, but there's lots of different film funds out there. CAM has a lot of great initiatives. Sundance has an Asian American uh, fellowship. Um, there um, is ACV and um, the LA Asian Pacific Film Festival has fi financing and funds and mentorship. So um, yeah, there, there are a lot of initiatives out there. Please seek them out. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, they're definitely, um, and, and then, you know, slowly but surely there are production companies in Hollywood. Um, Mary Lee started a company called A Major, which supports Asian films, Nina Yang Ben Jovi has been, you know, uh, supporting these films. Blue Marble, started by uh, Teresa Kang, is, is is specifically kind of gearing up, and um, hopefully, I will be announcing something soon as well. Oh yes, I, I absolutely agree, and and I do see that that change because I think, um, I mean, I may not answer this question as specifically, but I think I'm just seeing people who want to be a part of the change um, and not the problem. And they're putting their uh, work and financing into having more visibility. Uh, I'm just seeing more people getting behind production who maybe and being interested in financing who weren't um, financing independent films with AAPI specific things. So yes, absolutely. Amazing. Thank you guys so much. And with that beautiful final round of answers, um, on behalf of the organizers of this event, the participants, I want to extend a huge, huge thank you to you, the watcher, for being here and watching our discussion. This is all for you. Um, if you have any questions, you can find us at acmasocal.org. If you have any questions following up, you can email us at info at acmasocal.org. Alexa, Diane, Georgina, thank you all so, so much for being here today. That was a beautiful conversation. You are all such wonderful human beings. Thank you so much and have a lovely night, everyone.